I'm convinced the very fact he's there makes intercession. I'm convinced his blood makes intercession. And I believe he has words that make intercession. He's appeared in the presence of God for us. His blood speaks better words. And he speaks words to the Father on our behalf. You guys are amazing. I get just to pick up on your stories and feel the heart. That's dangerous right there. I, I never thought, I just want to tease out some of the things I was picking up as we were going through here. Isaiah 35 kept just reverberating. I'd encourage you to look at Isaiah 35. I haven't even looked at it in a while, but I keep, but I keep uh, feeling it today for you guys. I feel like the Lord is shaking the wilderness, and there's a, a shift of your wilderness. It says streams are going to break out of the wilderness. The wilderness and the wasteland shall rejoice. It talks about a blossoming, and the, the mutes shall sing. So I think there's a breaking of silence. And I would tie that in with Psalm 29. And those things, shaking, making, breaking. <laughs> Shakes the wilderness. Your wilderness is getting shaken. It makes the deer give birth. There's birthing. And it breaks the cedars. There's breakthrough. There's breakthrough. There's breakthrough from opposition. You've gotten worn down in the battle. The Lord said, I want to call you up. Come up higher. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Come on up. <laughs> Every once in a while, I'll start singing that old different stroke song. Uh... Moving on up. <laughs> I hope y'all remember that. That was, that was my childhood. <laughs> Lord, we love you. Oh. I'd encourage you just to meditate on Revelation 4. Let those scenes just get on the inside of you and speak them back to God and go on the journey of, of ascending and just, oh, just pray in the spirit until, until you get there. And you're like, when am I get there? You'll know when you're there. You'll know when you're there. And I promise you, this is how you shift the culture of your church is by being it. By being it is what shifts it. Not by talking about or even telling or delegating. It's being it. So just come out, come out and, and burn. A.W. Tozier says, what would happen if one of those burning creatures who surround the throne were to show up in our average pulpit? <laughs> what would they preach about? What would be their four-part message? He says, would they not charm and fascinate us with rapturous descriptions of the Godhead? And after hearing these ones talk about him, would we not demand of those who speak to us from the pulpit, speak from the mount of divine vision, or remain silent altogether? We got to restore witness that flows out of encounter. Oh, Jesus, thank you. Well, I want to, we'll just see if I can get to it. But I want to I wanna look at probably the person that has formed my philosophy of life and ministry more than anybody. I want to talk about Mary of Bethany. Little girl, we only see her three times in Scripture. She only said one phrase. 
Yet every time that we see her, Jesus is calling us to emulate her. You think we can do it? It's not about Mary versus Martha. You're like, oh God, here we go. I'm going to feel bad for sitting. <laughs> it's not about Mary versus Martha. It's about Mary before Martha. And I believe every true Mary will become an anointed Martha. I got everybody say, I'm a Mary. Well, what are you getting pregnant with? You sit long enough, you're going to get pregnant with something. The, the core issue of Martha is, you know the story. Go ahead, and I, I just looked at Luke 11, 1 through 3. Now go back to Luke 10, 38. Let's look at Luke 10, 38 through 42. Okay? Where's my Bible? All right. Just keep being messed up, all right? All right, there, there we go. There we go. I feel better now. <laughs> I feel better now. <laughs> hey, thank you. Ooh. Ooh. Got my youngest daughter with me on this trip. So awesome. It's my favorite thing in the world. I've got three daughters, 22, 19, and 11, almost 12. And... This is what we did, man. I've done it with all of them. And we just travel and get in the Holy Ghost together and build sweet connections. And I just love it. She's my, my chief intercessor this week. Oh, Jesus. All right, look at 39 or 38. Luke 10, 38. Now, it happened as they went that he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the feet of Jesus and heard his word. Martha was distracted. Everybody say distracted. Everybody say much serving. And she came to Jesus and she said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to get off her lazy behind and help me. <laughs> Jesus answered and said to her, that's the CKJV, Corey King James. Jesus answered and said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. One thing is needed. Mary has chosen the good part, and it won't be taken away from her. The courage, the absolute courage that's needed for leaders in this hour to come out of the swirl of all the stuff around Jesus and find ourselves at the feet of Jesus. We need courage. We need courage. We need to get delivered from the fear of man, from the man-pleasing spirit, from the sense of what we're doing, validating how much we're getting paid, and being driven by the fear of man to be busy when Jesus is in the house. The powerful reality of this story is Mary understood who was in her house and she discovered the glory of the moment and she refused to get lost in the swirl of the moment and said, the Son of God is in my house. And she dove to his feet, breaking protocol, breaking expectations, breaking the demands, the societal demands, the cultural demands, her own sister, and said, you can do whatever you want his words are my life. I'm diving to his feet, and I'm going to let his words define me. I'm going to let his words wash me, and I'm going to let him talk. In the first lesson on prayer, it doesn't start with your list. Here's the second lesson in prayer. It doesn't start with you talking. It doesn't start with you talking, but you listening. Prayer is not monologue. It's dialogue. And we speak the language of the word. God talks first. And until you let him impregnate you with his word and with his will, you have nothing to say. The words that move God are the words born of God. 
The words that move God are the words born of God. John 15, 7, if you abide in me, my words abide in you. You get whatever you want. Why? Because my will is filled you. And what you now want is what I've always wanted. And I'll always say amen. Prayer doesn't start with you talking, but with you listening. And now we go on the awkward journey of sitting with a God we barely know, with a book we barely know, and sitting in silence in the midst of a thousand demands and going on the detox like a heroin addict. Like a heroin addict in a padded white room dealing with the awkwardness of silence. Dealing with the awkwardness of sitting before God and learning how to sit long enough before the Word until it begins to move on the inside of us. With all the demands, with all the people texting us, saying, I need you now. My marriage is falling apart. My husband just left me. My kid's acting like a fool. All that stuff's happening. And yet the prioritizing of a life at his feet is real life. We need wise virgins in this hour. Matthew 25, wise virgins who prioritize the size of their present day intimacy than the size of their influence. The wise virgins in Matthew 25 not only had oil in their lamps, they had oil in their vessels, which means they had reserves and secret history with God not related to their public ministry. Mary said, I'm diving to his feet, letting his words wash me, and we find four descriptions about Martha. Distracted, a lot of serving, worried and troubled. And the core issue comes down to this. What is going to be your primary source of identity? Is it going to be the words that he speaks over you? Or is it going to be what you do for him? Let me say that again. The primary source of identity will either be the words he speaks over you or what you do for him. If you get your primary source of identity in what you do for him, hear me, you'll put in a nice smile and be a faithful servant for a while. But there comes a season to where if you don't get paid accordingly to how hard you've served and how hard you've worked, you will begin to get slowly angry and bitter towards Jesus over his fairness and you will begin to question Jesus' empathy, like Martha. Don't you care? Don't you see? Jesus, you're not fair. I work, she sits, and you're not telling her to stop. And Jesus is going to look at her, and guys, again, I believe every true Mary will become an anointed Martha. And an anointed Martha is one that's carrying the reward on the inside. One that's carrying the vision of God, not to get his attention, but because you already have his attention. And when you get that core primary source landed, then you're fruitful for decades, and you don't burn out. There is no burnout when you're carrying the reward. I'm loved and I'm a lover. I'm defined by what he speaks over me, not by what I do for him. And that's what happened to the church of Ephesus. Mighty Ephesus fell out of love. And Jesus said, don't make me choose, but if you make me choose, I'll always get rid of ministry so I can get back to your heart. Because I want both, big heart, big ministry. But don't make me choose. I get intense about this. <laughs> All right. One thing's needed. Come on, Jesus, get practical. Oh, it's not. Yeah, it is. You get this one thing right. It's going to answer 10 other, 10 other things in your life. You don't, it'll take you somewhere else, and you may not know till you're 40 or 60 or later on in life. Second time we see Mary, I could talk about this forever, I love it so much. The second time that we see Mary is in John 11. Because if you don't learn how to wait and to sit in the early season, when crisis comes knocking at your door, all you have 
is plastic phrases, buzzwords, and t-shirts, but no depth of reality in waiting before the Lord. It says in John 11, let's see what it says in John 11. I don't want to just say it. Look at John 11. John 11. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Everybody with me in verse 1? 11, 1. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. I love this. One of my favorite phrases in Scripture. Everybody say, it was that Mary. <laughs> Which Mary? That Mary. Who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. We're hearing about a story that's not going to happen until chapter 12. And yet John is connecting John 11 with John 12 by telling us something that Mary's going to do in the future with fragrant oil. And I want to tell you, it's the oil that gets produced in the crushing of John 11 that she pours out on Jesus in John 12. Oil gets produced in crushing. When you have to walk through divine delays, when Jesus does not break in on your timetable, and some of the dearest things die. They send a letter to Jesus. He whom you love is sick. Okay, it says Jesus loved Mary and loved Martha and her brother. So you would think that the natural next verse would be, so he quickly translates to Bethany, lays his hands on Lazarus, gets up, they have a party. That's what love does. It immediately answers the problem. Love immediately fixes it. But in this story, love waited two more days. Knowing that him waiting two more days means Lazarus dies. And now the furnace is intensified when they know he got the letter. They know he has the power. They know he has the love and connection to him. He's done it for so many. And here are his loved ones, the ones he loves, that has to go through the dark night of delay and the dark night of Jesus not immediately answering and in some ways things dying. Okay? And now sets the stage for the next four days. As all of the accusations come to the forefront, as all of the war over who is God, what you said, I know your promise, I know what you've said to me. I know what you said about this thing and about this connection and yet it died, the ministry died, the relationship died. How do I reconcile that God? And many things come out and I believe found in Martha and Mary are two responses to divine delay. And when things don't go like you thought it were going to go. And I believe they're directly connected to Luke chapter 10 of will you learn the first lesson of learning how to sit and wait in the presence of God. Because they really carry over into the next season. All right, let's quickly go. I'm not going to stay on this long. This is what I built the whole gift of tears around because of how powerful it is. Now, four days go by. I love this. Look with me in verse 20. So this is it, four days later. Now, Martha, as soon as. Everybody say, as soon as. Which means she didn't wait. She heard that Jesus was coming. She went and met him, but here's Mary again, sitting in the house. Sitting in the house. I picture it like this, four days later. Martha's pacing. I know, he's, I know he got the letter. I know he got the letter. I know he can break in. Why didn't he get here? Why are we in this situation? Brother's dead. Brother's stinking. It's a whole mess. Why are we having to go through this in Mary's sitting? I think it's interesting, and John doesn't waste a word by saying Mary's sitting again. Mary's waiting, Martha's pacing. Mary's waiting, Martha's pacing. As soon as she heard Jesus was coming, bang, she left. And she ran out to the edge of Bethany, and she's going to say the exact same phrase as Mary will say 10 verses later. Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. 
Look with me. you got to see this. All right, he says this. Just follow this whole dynamic. Verse 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, and I can hear the organ music in the background, and I can hear the Pentecostal faith preacher come out. But even now, hallelujah, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus, stone cold, looks you right in the face. Your brother will rise again. Then the organ starts back up. I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Stone cold looks right at her. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Oh, yes, Lord. I believe that you're the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming to the world. Hallelujah. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, saying, the teacher's coming is calling for you. <laughs> Whenever someone says, I know, they don't know. That's the very indictment they don't know. Is when they're overconfident, they do know. Because there are mysteries in the kingdom, and there is wrestles and tensions that aren't immediately rectified. And I feel like Jesus was inviting Martha into something deeper, saying, Will you let this moment cut you? And you not just hide behind your nice little polished answers, your nice little theology, your safe place of reserving resurrection for a future day. Not knowing that resurrection's here for today. Quit hiding behind a nice theology that keeps your heart at a distance. Quit protecting yourself with safe theologies. Let the moment cut you and let it release guttural, I don't know what's going on. Because that's what faith looks like. I know who you are, but I don't understand why you haven't gotten here, and I'm not getting out of the tension until this thing gets rectified. Jesus does not play according to all of her I knows. He just tells her statements. Your brother will rise again. I am the resurrection and the life. And all of a sudden, Martha hits a wall called, we're talking on two different frequencies here. I'm talking hallelujah, you're being this. And it's almost like, you ever try to talk to somebody and you just can't connect? They're just doing this and they're not connecting. So she hits the wall saying, I need to go back to Luke 10 and learn how to wait before you. She runs back to Mary and said, he's calling for you. We don't see Jesus ask for her. We don't see Jesus ask for her. I think she looked in her eyes saying, I'm past my pay grade here. Whatever Mary learned in Luke 10, I've got to pull on that because she's learned something about you I don't know. Where Martha tried to barge into the doctor's office and get a healing or get a breakthrough, Mary got called from the waiting room. She got called from the waiting room. And look with me in verse. Oh, here we go, here we go, here we go. Verse 32. Then when Mary came where Jesus was, number one, she saw him. Number two, here she is all the time at his feet. We're going to find out in verse 33, she's weeping. And she's going to say to him the very same phrase as Martha. Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. Do you know you can pray the exact same prayer from two different places and provoke two different responses in God? It's not about the right language. It's the right place from which the prayer comes from. Where Martha said it, I believe, more accusatory. Mary said it more in worship, and I don't understand, and I'm not getting out of the tension. Why didn't you get here in time? Why are we in this situation? It says this. It says that when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, look at this. Now she's awakened something in him. He groaned in the spirit. He groaned in the spirit. Oh, I believe God wants to awaken groans. I believe there's an intercession that awakens a groan of compassion, a groan, a groan of deliverance. The warrior God begins to get aroused. When he begins to intervene in the areas where the enemy has taken 
would just wreak havoc in your churches or in marriages or with children. I believe that there can be an intercession that awakens a groan of compassion to raise dead things, dead marriages, dead families, dead finances, dead bodies. He groaned in the Spirit. How did John know to write that? What does it look like when Jesus starts groaning? What does that look like? Uh, what's it look like? What's it sound like? Uh, which means the bowels of God are opened. And now he's moving into action. Where have you laid him? Come and see. And then the longest verse in the Bible ensues. Jesus wept. I say it kind of in a funny way, but I'm convinced that thing was around 30 minutes. For years, I'd saw it as a couple of trickles on the way to the grave. But as I've had time to meditate on this passage, I'm convinced this was a 20 to 30 minute explosion of divine emotions. Now, this, is what, this is what I want to say to you. Come on, stick with me. I know we, a lot of us are hearing wah, 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 but it's okay. That's why we're recording it. You can hear it later. What did Jesus say when he got the letter that Lazarus was sick? This is not going to end in death. But it's for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified through it. That's one of the greatest faith-filled statements. I know how this is going to end. Why didn't Jesus then just translate to the resurrection of Lazarus? What is it about letting the story unfold and for Jesus, that's exactly right, showing up to his friends in their darkest hour and connecting with them in the place of prayer that was absolutely critical and necessary of partnership into moving into the resurrection season. We all love the translation to the resurrection. That's where we always go. Nobody gets lost in the valley of tears, and yet that's where many of us live. And we don't know how to rectify the divine delays. We don't know how to even theologically wrestle through these things. The f true faith says, God, I know who you are. I don't understand why I'm in this situation, and I ain't going anywhere. I'm not bailing out. I'm not coming up with another theology to bail me out. I ain't going hyper-optimism and I ain't going hyper-pessimism. I'm living in the tension. That's where the real reality gets birthed on the inside of you. Jesus wept. He wept long enough for people to have commentary about his weeping. You know you can cry for a while. First off, how many people get to see ugly crying of you? Ones, twos, threes. The Son of God comes into the world and he weeps. God weeps. The vulnerability of God, the connection with the plight and the brokenness of humanity. It's weeping of tears of compassion, tears of love, tears of hatred of death, tears of anger at the religious spirit. It was Lazarus' resurrection that got Jesus killed. It was the final blow. They couldn't deal with it anymore. It was over once Lazarus was raised. Jesus knew that, and he's weeping over the fact that in the blinding sight of Yahweh in the flesh manifesting these realities, they still want to kill him. And he weeps, and you watch him weep. And then he comes out of that season, and now he's making his way to the grave, and he tells them to move the stone, and now we get to see faith-filled Martha. That behind all that I knows is a, let's get practical, Jesus. Look at this. Look at verse 39. Then Jesus said, take away the stone. Now Martha said, time out, Jesus. By this time, there's a stench. He's been dead four days. And Jesus said, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Which means this, I believe Martha was masking unbelief behind real awesome statements. It wasn't real. 
I don't believe it was real. I believe she didn't know anything more. All right. Jesus groaning, take away the stone. And then they took away the stone. And he says, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people, I said this. When he said this, he said, Lazarus, come forth. And a man came out of a grave. I believe, and I, I really believe this. I believe that many of us have been in the John 11 season. I believe the church has been in a John 11 season. I've been there, I believe there's been loss, death, difficulty, trial over the last years. And it's got us to be shaken to the core and move into a different mode of prayer. It's taken us to a place that we don't understand. And he's bringing us into uncharted waters personally and corporately and exposing things inside of us. And all bankrupt, nice little password phrases aren't working like they used to. And he's taking us to a deeper place, a deeper groan, a deeper place of wrestling in the tension. And I believe from this place, the oil is getting produced. And I believe out of this resurrection is coming. I believe it's beginning to crack through right now. I believe we're going to start seeing resurrection power move, a move of God like we've never seen. Resurrection power and leaders who have come through the dark night who know how to navigate it. Because when you come through death and come through on the other side, there's this fearlessness of knowing there ain't nothing dead God can't raise. There ain't nothing dead God can't raise. There ain't nothing dead God can't raise. <laughs> this just reminded me, I'm going to trust it's the Lord. I love basketball, the NBA. A new coach just got hired for the Lakers, Darvin Ham. And they were asking him in his, in his uh, pre, uh, his new, uh, he, he showed up to the Lakers yesterday and shared, and they go, how do you feel about dealing with basketball? He goes, when I was eight, I got shot in the face. And he goes, you have two options. You're either going to be fearful or fearless. He goes, I'm going fearless. Go with me to John 12, and then we'll, then we'll finish this. Verse 1, then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus, who had been raised from the dead, whom he had raised from the dead, and they made him a supper. Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. I'd be wanting to talk to Lazarus. What were those four days like? What would you see? Mary goes, forget Lazarus, forget Simon the leper. That's what one of the other gospels tells us is there. Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas, who would betray him, says, why was this sold and not given to the poor? Verse 7, Jesus says, leave her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial, for you have the poor with you always, but you don't always have me. Mary's going to take the oil produced in one season and is going to break into the room, breaking protocol, breaking all the expectations and putting all eyes on Jesus as she wasted $30,000 on Jesus. She broke the alabaster flask, anointed Jesus' feet. Every time we see her, she's at the feet of Jesus. She anointed his feet. She made a ruckus. She just put all eyes on him and poured it on him and caused all the disciples to manifest. Everyone vying for who's going to sit at his right and who's going to sit at his left. They were all jockeying for positions and she goes, I'm going to prepare him for his burial because I know the burial is not the end of the story. Those disciples could not get it through their heads that he was going to die. She not only got it, understood it, she prepared him for it. And Jesus will say in, the, in Mark 14, wherever this gospel is preached, what this woman has done will be told as a memorial. Oh, friends, I believe coming out of this season is going to be such gratitude and love and affection. Fear is being broken off of us. Fear is being broken off the church. Anxiety is being broken off the church. Torment is being broken off the church. 
And to a person who has been delivered from the spirit of fear, they're dangerous. They become perfect in love. And it becomes costly. Sacrificial giving is nothing. Sacrificial lives are nothing. And they pour it out on Jesus and they love him extravagantly. Sacrificial love is going to mark us. And I believe he wants to take alabaster flask and that we begin to love Jesus again in the middle of our churches. I feel like there's going to come something glorious in this day. We're in the midst of a shift. We're in the midst of a a transition in the church. And there are many dynamics to this transition. One of the big ones is we're seeing the ministry of worship and prayer move from a back room ministry with a few women. And it's coming to the front room. I want to say thank you women for carrying the torch, but it's over. Things not resting on the few women who do the intercessory group. There's an intercessor in heaven and it's not a woman. Jesus forever lives to make intercession. He rules through intercession. I don't see the calling of an intercessor in the Bible. I believe it's the calling of every born again believer. You and I have been born into the ministry of intercession. Now, there are some who obey it in a given way to it, but we've all been born into the ministry of intercession. We stand before God. We join Jesus. Oh, that's a whole other thing I want to talk about another time. Three things about Jesus' intercession. Number one, you need to see him at the right hand of the Father. Number two, you need to receive his intercession for you. How does Jesus make intercession in the throne room? Does he rock like Lou Engle? Maybe. Has he got a flag up there? Does he got a shofar? What's he doing? What's Jesus' intercession look like? I'm convinced the very fact he's there makes intercession. I'm convinced his blood makes intercession. And I believe he has words that make intercession. He's appeared in the presence of God for us. His blood speaks better words. And he speaks words to the Father on our behalf. Everybody look around the room right now. All right? Some of many of y'all know each other. I don't know many of you. Do you know what I'd be thinking if I knew you? How are you in here? What are you doing in here? Haven't you had a thousand opportunities to quit? Come up with something else, get a new job, go back to construction, go back to fishing, do something else with your life. The very fact you're in here is the very fact that there's a man at the right hand of the Father who forever lives to make intercession for you. Simon, Satan's asked to sift you as wheat. And you told him no, didn't you, Jesus? No. I told him to take his best shot on one condition. I get to pray for him. that your faith should not fail and after you've returned strengthen your brethren and I believe there have been Peters who have gone through sifting seasons there has been sifting seasons every fault line exposed on the inside of you and you're here you're more tender you're not as confident and you're poised for another Pentecost You got to let him pray for you before he prays through you. He's got to pray for you before he prays through you. Are you a good receiver? Yes, you are. You're good receivers. Wow. So you got to see him, you receive it, and then you join him. Romans 8, 26, Spirit helps us, prays through us. Anyway. (sighs) 
Let's just stand. I'm going to pray for you. Uh. Who, 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 who can bear witness with you? Feel like you've been in that sifting season? Raise your hand. We look across this room, and here we are. Here we are because there's a man that prayed for you. And he waked up his friends in the middle of the night who prayed in tongues. They didn't even know they were praying for you. Some of them did. Others didn't. But you're here. Hey! And that same man that got prayed through that dark night, he was a coward in one season. He was fearful in one season. And in the next season, anointed afresh with the Holy Ghost. He came out of that upper room. And he said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass, says God. I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. 3,000 cut to the heart. Hey, who leads like Jesus? No one. Hey, this is his way. There's something about Jesus, what he did with his own disciples. Those disciples for three and a half years were riding the wave of his anointing. They were living under his anointing. But the last six months leading up to the death was Jesus exposing them, saying, guys, seasons are changing. You're not just going to live under Papa's wings and the past breakthrough. I want you to bring you to the end of yourself and get you into an upper room because I want to release a fresh outpouring. I want to release a fresh move. When they got to that upper room, they were completely decimated, delivered of all their own strength and wisdom and ingenuity and strategy. It blows me away. They weren't even able to start Christianity on a 40-day conference with Jesus. Huh. Do you understand how we can take those pamphlets and change the world? Jesus goes, no, I don't need, it's not going to be information that's going to change the world. It's fire on broken people, on empty vessels. It's fire on empty vessels. That's what's going to change the world. The fire of God. Hey! We need the fire of the Holy Spirit. There's a new birthing that's coming. Open your hands. I want to pray for you. The information matters, but it's fire to the information. Father, I pray for every pastor and leader. I thank you for these beautiful men and women. God, I can feel your heart for them. These are the excellent ones in whom is all your delight. They've weathered many storms. And I thank you, Lord, like John 11, or uh, Matthew 11, it says J John was, was not offended. Blessed is he who's not offended. Do you know, Matthew 11, John was in prison, and I, and I just feel, John wrote Jesus saying, are you the one? And Jesus goes, blessed is he who's not offended. Blessed, is, blessed are you who are not offended when you know I have the power to get you out of prison and I don't. <laughs> <laughs> many of you have passed through massive offense test and I just feel the pleasure of God over you you kept your heart clean you, you kept your heart clean you worked through your bitterness you worked through the stuff and I feel like that's where the fire rests 